by and large, for the most part, the historiography of the Caribbean has tended to focus on the rural agrarian plantation and has not looked very closely at, at, at those at activities outside of that sphere. Um, most studies of plantation America, in fact, of, of America in general, tend to focus on that plantation sector and tend to be oblivious to the fact that many Caribbean territories did not, in fact, have a plantation culture, did not have um, plantation agriculture as a feature of, care, of, the, of the existence. Indeed, if we were to go to, further to the north of the Caribbean, many of our, our neighbors, if we may call them that because of a distance, um, had what I may call a maritime or marine culture. If you go up to uh, Norfolk, you go to the area of the Bahamas, you, you, um, you even go to Anguilla, any, 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 you could choose almost any, any island in the northern Caribbean, except from the larger, uh, larger territories, larger islands. You will find that in many cases, um, the industries were heavily based on seafaring and on maritime activities. But um, Caribbean historians and historians from other places have found it um, useful to ignore that particular aspect of the history of, of the region. Indeed, one of the leading scholars of the Caribbean historical scene, uh, Professor Vereen Shepherd of the Mona campus of the University of West Indies, has observed that inquiry into the class and race dynamics of Caribbean society outside of the plantation sector has largely been relegated to a secondary position. In fact, she says, the study of the plantation elite has been considered more socially significant than the study of other producers. So it is against that background that I, that I thought, think it is necessary for us to shift the focus somewhat uh, I'm aware of the importance of plantation agriculture. I'm aware of the importance of plantation staples um, to our existence, to our diet, but we ought to pay some attention to non-plantation and non-agrarian uh, aspects of our diet and culture as well. One aspect of the plantation, non-plantation milieu, which has received less than a whisper in the historiography is that of fishing and fisheries. Thus, notwithstanding the fact that in many Caribbean countries, maritime activities represented the main economic activity and not the rural plantation, one can virtually point the number of, count the number of works devoted to the reality of the non-plantation sector on the fingers of one hand. With respect to the fishing trade, one pioneering work that has identified the place of fishing in the colonial New World is that of K.G. Davies. K.G. Davies, writing about the, the early um, colonization of the New World, um, notes that of all of the imperatives that led to European penetration of the New World, quote, the first pull and the longest and steadiest in the 16th century was fish. Fish was the biggest pull that pulled Europeans from Europe into the New World. While it's clear that Davies' investigation is not focused on the uh, Caribbean context, the value of his observation is that it directs us to the understanding that the colonial enterprise was not only about sugar and gold and silver bullion. Another contribution to the discussion is found in the article by Richard Price, an article entitled Caribbean Fishing and Fishermen, a historical sketch. This study also directs us to the importance of fishing and fishes to a deeper understanding of Caribbean social history, and it is on the screen, an extract from what he said, and they want to alert you that we're going to be um, seeing a number of extracts which will help to build the picture, the composite picture that I hope to build as we continue in our discussion tonight. And he notes, this is Richard Price, and you can see it there, Caribbean fishermen, at first Indians and the Africans were from the beginning a privileged slave subgroup within the plantation system and that their, spe their special socioeconomic role permitted a particularly smooth transformation to a life as free fishermen, whether this came out before or after general emancipation. The plantation system, in spite of its generally repressive character, incidentally endowed fishing slaves with valuable economic skills as well as with considerable self-reliance and independence. So there's a quotation from Richard Price which establishes the importance of fishing 
in the life of the African workers, the African laborers, and, and the Amerindians. In addition to the contribution of Davies and Price, we might also take note of the contribution made by Professor Bonham Richardson. He notes that by and large, the ruling classes in the Anglophone Caribbean tended to devolve fishing activities to the natives. Natives mean, of course, the Amerindian, the, um, the Aborigines, Aboriginal groups. This reflected a perception that the seasonal nature of fishing and the relatively low level of preservation technologies in the, used in the region did not offer much hope of making major economic capital in the fishing industry. Richardson's analysis um, might be useful in understanding one side of the research coin. However, it misses the other side. That is, it doesn't pay any attention at all to the perceptions held by, quote unquote, those natives to whom the industry is entrusted. Moreover, the same issues of seasonality that might have scared off um, the plantation owners and, and, and the elite in the society from fishing, um, and the risks that might have precluded greater involvement of the, of the ruling classes were present in the immediate post-emancipation period too. In that latter period, the involvement of fisher folk might well suggest that their analysis of the possibilities inherent in the fishing trade represented the possible fulfillment of expectations of social and, and economic freedom. In short, what I'm saying is that the issues that might have led um, the ruling classes to, um, to, 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 as it were, be, leave most of the fishing to, um, to quote unquote natives, the same issues that might have, might have led them to leave, them, leave that the fishing trade there might also have to explain why after emancipation, the formerly enslaved took to fishing as an opportunity for them to, um, to realize the expectations of social and economic freedom. The three um, contributions then, those of Davies, <coughs> excuse me, Price and Richardson, provide a strong imperative for our own discussion tonight of fish and fishing in the Barbados context. From the earliest contact of outsiders with this island, commentators have made some mention of fish, fishing and fishermen. And it is surprising in this context that historians have paid very so little attention to the sociocultural and economic aspects of the fishing industry. Additionally, while our investigation speaks largely of fish, <clears throat> and more specifically of flying fish, excuse me, other aspects of our food culture include the harvesting of other organisms from the sea and also from fresh water habitats. And I just want to say that um, even though I'm speaking primarily of the sea, we also have to recognize that there are freshwater habitats. Not many in Barbados. We have small streams, which are glorified by the name river. Um, we have small areas in, in the island where you have fresh water, and they, they were also cultivated and harvested. Thus, along the way, we do well to pay attention to the harvesting of sea eggs, quote unquote, sea cat, and I, I pondered long and hard as to why it's called sea cat, lobster, crayfish, and even of turtles, whales, and conchs, because these two also are marine um, animals, organisms, etc. <clears throat> it is clear then that in pre prehistoric times, the Ab Aboriginal peoples who inhabited Barbados fished predominantly on the near shore and the reefs and the banks. However, as C.N. C. Roach informs us, that is, and that quotation is here on the screen, the ancient craftsmen, he's talking about the Aboriginal groups, left it on record that our Aborigines were fishers <clears throat> who were not content with capturing by hook and line or in nets, fish which frequent the shadows near the shore, that they, who were not content to do that, they ventured out into the ocean in search of deep sea fish. So the very earliest Aboriginal inhabitants of Barbados, and we have the evidence to support this, were, were avid fishermen. And they used hook, line, net, and they also ventured out in search of deep sea fish. <clears throat> of the near shore or reef fish that were caught by these original inhabitants, we may identify as recorded by clear representations. And by that I mean that when we, when we search the middles, when we search the archaeolog archaeolog archaeological sites that, uh, where these persons left evidence of their, of their presence, we find clear representations of angel fish, barbers. Anybody knows what a barber is? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't bring along a picture of that. But barracuda, we must have heard about that. Snapper fish, snappers, jacks, mackerel, parrotfish, snook, skeets. Evidence that these people also fish for shark 
and pelagic fish such as tuna and dolphin, and for flying fish is also found when we search their middens, when we search their, their, their archaeological sites. And these things are found not only in pottery forms, but also in the bones found when we search their, um, their fireplaces and we look at what they ate. It may, it may be noted here that there were other types of fish that I have not mentioned, not listed here, that were caught by the Arawaks and the Caribs and other groups which inhabited this region. The fishing abilities of the Aborigines were well known by the time the first in European settlers arrived in Barbados. Richard Ligon, who lived in, on the island in the 1650s, wrote, and here again, and we have it on the board, as for the Indians, <clears throat> we have but few, and those fetched from other countries, some from the neighboring islands, some from the main, the main we use for footmen and killing fish, which they are good at. With their own bows and arrows, they will go out and in a day's time kill as much fish as will serve a family of a dozen persons two or three days, if you can keep fish so long. So right here, right here there's evidence. Richard Ligon, an Englishman who comes to the Barbies to work in the plantation sector, he observes um, the use of, of Aborigines as fishermen. <coughs> Excuse me. Ligon's account of the fishing Indians suggests that by and large they fish in no shear areas, by and large. Ligon had tasted flying fish on his journey to Barbados on board a ship that brought him here. But he also refers to a Colonel Humphrey Waldron in Barbados who had, quote, a same boat with a same net. And well, the boat with a same net, I put, it, I put in the, um, sort of the modern day rendering. To catch fish withal, which his own servants and slaves, and we're going to come back to that point a little later, put out to sea and twice or, or thrice a week bring home all sorts of small and great fishes. So from the very early moment of settlement in Barbados, we have Richard Ligon um, observing um, fishing activity, <clears throat> and he identifies um, persons with same boats. Now, a same boat is not, is not unique to the Caribbean. Of course, they could be found in the um, European waters as well. <clears throat> While the extract does not mention flying fish, that is not to say that it was unlikely that Waldron's catch would have included some of these fish. We also have evidence from another person who visits Barbados in 1632 and observed that the island in comparison with St. Kitts had more fish, quote, more fish and better fishing. Cole also had, um, this man Henry Cole, also had first-hand experience in fishing during his stay in Barbados and he informs his readers that he used nets to catch fish there and that, quote, the sea is well furnished with fish and excellent places to fish in, 1632. 1650s, 1632, we have Europeans coming to Barbados and they are recognizing that one of the important aspects of the, of the environment in Barbados is a fishing environment. <clears throat> Another traveler who visited Barbados in the 1680s is Sir Hans Sloan and he had his first taste of flying fish possibly on board of his ship on, the, on his way to Barbados. He described the, the, exi the experience thus, and again the quotation is on the, is on the screen for you. Notice I say bored from time to time, you must excuse me. At my age, um, I, I, my memory still talks about blackboards. Now there's people talk about whiteboards and other things, but you must understand I come from a different generation, and a different age. <clears throat> and this is what he says, this is Hans Sloan. Um, he says, they, flying fish, are very good victuals, tasting like a fresh herring. They are common in most parts of the East and West Indies in Japan, <coughs> and, the, and the East Last, that should be East Last, the Ladrones, that's a reference to the Northern Mariana Islands, which are named Las Islas de los Ladrones by Magellan, where they're eaten. They are sometimes more in one place of the sea than, than another. So again, another traveler, all in the 17th century. <coughs> we haven't moved over the 17th century yet, but each traveler who's coming to Barbados, each traveler who's on the way here is noting um, the existence of flying fish and is having an experience with eating some flying fish too. We meet yet another traveler who visits Barbados in 1722. So we move from the 1630s, 1650s, 1680 to 1722. He is John Atkins, who was a surgeon in the Royal Navy. As his ship approached the latitude of the island, he records that each day there were several sightings of flying fish. As he landed in the island and had the opportunity to describe the food culture of the Barbadian population, free and enslaved, he was enabled to inform us that the way of feeding such a multitude and of providing necessaries by in an island yielding little besides sugar 
is principally by their fisheries and importations. The sea gives them plenty of flying fish, dolphins, that is Dorado or Mai Mai, barracuda and kingfish, particularly the first flying fish. They bait with their own species, which thrown about the fish playing such numbers to the boats that they take them up with dip nets and sometimes the dolphins with them. The season goes off at the autumnal equinox. Now, this is a 1722 reference to Barbados. And, it's not, and while um, Barbados is a, obviously a sugar island, a plantation island, the emphasis here on coming to Barbados is fish. And I, I'm, I'm saying that uh, when we look at these early um, accounts, it should already alert us to something that is happening in the island, and it should tell us something about the nature of, of the food supply chain within the island itself. It is quite possible that one of the boats that was witnessed by Atkins might have belonged to a man called Emmanuel Vigars, whose 1726 will records the same boat, oars, mart, mass, sorry, and all the appurtenances that, that um, to her belong, which was bequeathed to his son, Joseph. Also, um, he, um, we, also we also note his identification of other fish species, that's the one that we just read, assists us in painting the tableau vivant of the marine environment. Again, we are informed by another 18th century traveler, Dr. George Pinkard, who, like Atkins, was a surgeon also in the Royal Navy of the Barbadian, Barbadian maritime scene. The extract which follows has immense value to our discussion, not least of which is the vivid imagery employed and the historical documentation that is provided. He tells us, that's Dr. George Pinkard, the novelty of immense multitudes of fish darting from the sea and taking wing in the air, you would believe attracted our attention. To speak of fishes flying might seem to be a traveler's tale. We were therefore led to a minute investigation of the fact. We watched them with a skeptical eye. And at many times, as at many different times, before we admitted even the existence of our evidence of our own senses, we have no hesitation in saying that fishes do fly. The fish is about the size of a herring. Again, the, the references to what Europeans knew, and, they, and that's, that's the reference point. And they are caught in great numbers near Barbados. Again, the identification of the island, the flying fish, where they are pickled and salted and used as very common food. The day before we made land, we met with shoals of flying fish. This is the experience that we have of, of all these, these um, visitors to the island. 17th century, 18th century. From the evidence we have observed thus far, therefore, it seems clear by, that by the latter half of the 18th century, Barbadian gourmets had created a connection with the flying fish, such that few visitors to the island could avoid commenting on this feature of the island's food culture, and certainly of its economic culture. The connection with the flying fish with Barbados and Barbadians has made it even into the poetic genre. James Granger's poem, written following a visit to Barbados in 1764, devotes one stanza to the fishing trade. An extract from his poem reads thus, Each sail is set to catch the favoring gale, while on the yard arm the harpooner sits, strikes the bonita or the shark it snares, the fringe urtica spreads her purple form to catch the gale and dances o'er the waves. Small winged fishes on the shrouds of light and beauteous dolphins gently played around. This is a poem, 1764, written by James Granger, where he catches um, the, the essence of, of a trip to Barbados sailing across the ocean and, of course, encountering flying fish and other fish, and he mentions the dolphin. I believe that the urtica he's talking about is, is, is more likely to be um, the man of war, we call him man of war, Portuguese man of war, or jellyfish of some kind. In a footnote to this poem, the author noted that this extraordinary, I think there should be another one there, this extraordinary species of fish, winged fishes, yes, that's it, uh, um, is only found in the warm latitudes. Being pursued in the water by a fish of prey called albacores, they betake themselves in shoals to flight, and in the air are often snapped by the garayo, a sea fowl. They sometimes fall on the shrouds of decks of ships. They are well tasted, sick, and commonly sold at Barbados. 
Here's the Granger again, again. We haven't even got into the 20th century. We haven't even got anywhere near there. But every single account, every single account you read identifies Barbados, it identifies plant fish, it identifies dolphin, bonitas, and other fish. For the historian then, investigating any aspect of social culture, finding one or two primary sources that add to the tapestry of the study is cause for great excitement. However, encountering as many texts as we have so far is a virtual historic and gastronomic delight. But as with a typical Chinese meal, the historic excitement knows no limits when you realize that there are several courses to the meal. Hence, you'll agree with me that the following sources that we will come to in a few minutes more than amply prepare us for the des later dessert that we will encounter when we come closer to, closer to our contemporary period, not, although we're not going to get full into that. In that context, I introduce you to yet another commentator on the Barbados historical scene, Reverend Griffith Hughes. He was a graduate of John, St. John's College in Oxford at the time when there was a tremendous interest in the field of natural history. Eventually, Hughes was posted to Barbados where he served as rector of St. Lucy's Parish Church. He used this as the opportunity of, of this posting to carry, carry out a reasonably thorough survey of the flora and the fauna of the island. Since his focus was on um, was on natural history, one might, one might um, expect him not to say much, if any, about the culinary aspects of the fishing trade. Rather, we might expect him to tell us a great deal about the biology of the greatest of the various species, and so he does. Yule spends a great deal of time describing the biological aspects of the various fish species, and not surprisingly, pays considerable attention to the mechanism of flight employed by the fish, flying fish. He pauses long enough in his description to inform his readers that were it not for the prodigious um, um, production of the species, um, the, the species would, would long since have been gutted out of existence. Thus he says, and you have it there, the, the increase is prodigiously great. Otherwise, the poor species must have long ago been destroyed, for they are prey to men, fish, and birds having no certain tenure of life. I like the language of these, of these persons who describe the scenes that they are seeing as they approach the island. In observing the fish species used for food in Barbados, Hughes identifies five fish which he believed could be classified under the label flying fish. These were the flying, what he called the flying garfish, the sea bat, the guineaman, and I think fishermen of today would be familiar with the term guineaman, the balahu. And of these fish, the garfish and the balahu and the guineaman possess a bone structure, similar to that possessed by their better known cousin, the flying fish. In fact, we might well know that these fish were often included in the same family, Exocetidae, as a flying fish, which is Exocetus volatans. So, as I said, Hughes was a very keen observer of this thing. Incidentally, I don't know how many of us know that if you're going to bone a garfish, the same, the same skill, the same bone structure is there. So, if you, if you can't bone flying fish, you can't bone garfish. You have to, you have to, you have to know how the, how the bones are laid out and, and remove them in the same kind of way. They have the same kind of structure. I used to fish garfish many years ago. Indeed, um, I have some experiences also in diving for some other denizens of the sea many, many years ago. I, uh, my diet has changed considerably, but there was a time when I used to push out a, 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 a galvanized um, bath pan, a huge one, out to sea, um, diving for sea eggs off the backswap coast. Um, I, 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 I almost drowned because of that experience. Um, I got my first diving mass, and as you know, diving mass tend to, um, tend to, um, to magnify what, what you see. So there was either, um, you see the tide was, was going out, um, as, it's going, as we see, as, as the tide was going out, I kept pushing the bath pan out, and kept going for sea ice, coming up and dropping them in the bath pan. And finally, as I got to a fairly far distance out, I saw the biggest sea egg that I'd ever seen in my life, and determined that there was no way that I could leave that sea egg alone. I had to get it. So I began to dive down for it. But I had, I had, I had not measured the distance from the, from, the, from the shore, and I had not realized that where it was going, what, the, the, what we call a shelf, just off back swap, the sand, as it were, 
it dips down into a shell. So there was I, I was going down forevermore, and finally, finally just touched the sea egg and put it, put it in my hand and then looked up, and by the time I looked up, the water was relatively green. And I was, I was so far down. And then, I was, and then I had to get back up there. And getting back up there, with, uh, having not practiced um, holding breath for so long was, was a chore. And I, I began to swallow water before I could reach the surface. But what was most disappointing is that after I got to the surface, having escaped with my life, I then took off the diving mask, put it off, and I saw that the sea egg, which almost killed me, was a small sea egg, <laughs> after all. It was a bit sad after all, that, after all that effort to see that. Two other references by visitors to Barbados in the early 19th century contribute to our historical survey. Richard Wyville, who visited the island in 1796, and again between 1806 and 1807, was a British military officer. On his second assignment to the island on January 20, 1906, he wrote, Vast quantities of flying fish are brought to the market. Their flesh is rather dry, and the, but the rolls are esteemed um, a, a, um, a luxury. Another visitor to the, um, to the uh, island, Matthew Gregory Lewis, the proprietor of a Jamaican plantation, wrote that the, um, right, the dolphin and the flying fish were very good food. And he wrote, um, um, that they're about the size of the uh, herring. They're supposed to feed on spawn and see what he calls the um, animalikai, that is a bit of a misspelling there, and will not take the bait. But on, again, again, we meet it, it is like a recurring decimal. On the shores of Barbados, which they frequent in great numbers, multitudes, they're caught in wide nets spread upon the surface of the sea. Lewis also observed the methods used at that time to catch dolphin. Apparently, the fishermen used a type of fishing spear, which had what we describe as fin barbs, and a long rope affixed to a staff. On the other end of the rope, there was a large lead weight. The fishermen had come to associate the appearance of flying fish with the presence of dolphin, and they often used the flying fish as bait. Once the dolphins were attracted near the boat, the spear was used. The lead weight acted as a counterbalance that facilitated the hoisting of the dolphins into the boats. Quite apart from the observations of visitors, though, it was perhaps inevitable that Barbadians themselves would also record aspects of the fishing trade in their diaries and letters. One Barbadian who did so was Judge Nathan Lucas, um, who's recorded in several um, of the journal, of, journal articles of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. And he began to record some aspects of the island's history in the 1820s. In Lucas's uh, recollection, and he says, although the flying fish be inhabitants of all the tropical seas throughout the world, to the best of my information, yet it is more singular that in no other place so far as come to my knowledge, except in this island, are they taken as an article of food for mankind. And I will, I will, I will suggest to you that while this is written in the 1820s, there are one or two other places where you might find flying fish used as food, but not many. You'll find them you, in Tobago, you'll find them now, but Tobago at one time, Tobagonians did not eat a lot of flying fish. Um, it seems that that is a, that, that's a Barbadian import. Barbadians went to Tobago and, and introduced that to them. And also I'm told that, um, that in one or two of the French islands, you might find some flying fish, and also in Trinidad, uh, you might find some. But again, if you find flying fish being fried in Trinidad, you could almost be certain that the person who introduces the trade, that is a Bajan. Uh, probably Bajan from Levantil or someplace like that. Indeed, I'm told that the reason why um, the name Bajan came to be applied is that the Trinidadians really um, saw the Bajans as Bajans. And since they were Bajans, um, the name Bajan or Bajan came to be applied. But as Lucas is saying, no other place, no other place um, is it taken the article for, for mankind. He said, I said something else. Their vast support from November to July every year, particularly if the weather be dry, <clears throat> and so plentifully are they taken, if you can turn to the other, oh yes, that's here, that, free, uh, that frequent attempts have been made to preserve them by pickling, to preserve them as an article of commerce, but hitherto without much success. 
And one reason may be that they are heated in the boats, all open before they're brought to shore in the evening where they're gutted, salted, etc. You see what's happening, and this is long, obviously long, this long predates the days of refrigeration and all the other things that we, we, take, so, um, you know, we take so much for granted. But in that time, you have a boat going out to sea. Um, the boat is out there for the entire day. By the time the boat um, comes to shore, these are, these are sailboats. By that time, some of the fish are obviously um, um, beginning to, to decay. And, and by that time, even if you try to, even if you try to preserve, um, that is not necessarily going to work as well as if you had some other method of getting them more quickly to shore. Locus's description reveals his thorough acquaintance with the, with the fishing trade at Barbados. <clears throat> he notes that the fish were generally eaten, fried, bone, or not. <coughs> Excuse me. And he had discovered that it took about three flying fish to make a pong. Have you ever, have you ever weighed them yet? But roughly about that. In concluding his discussion of fish and fishing, Lucas cited an account of the fishing trade written by a close friend, David Martindale. A search of the records in the Barbados Department of Archives identifies a David Martindale who lived along Bay Street. And I suspect this is the same person who was Lucas's friend. It is more unlikely that he, he, uh, he was uh, the author of the letter written to Lucas. He lived in, B in Bay Street in a place called the Watering, Watering Place. So obviously a place where people idled from the boats in the air, got the water, etc. And since Bay Street fronted on Carolina Bay, and from almost any vantage point he could see the boats in the local fishing fleet, then we could say that he must have had some knowledge of the fishing environment. In any case, we extract a lengthy portion of his letters, his letter to Lucas, since it represents perhaps the best commentary to be had from the perspective of an early 19th century participant observer. Martin Dell wrote, the flying fish is an inhabitant of all latitudes within the tropics. And it's a rather curious circumstance. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Bomus is special, thank you. Or Spring Garden special. And it's a rather curious circumstance that, as far as I am informed, either traditionally or historically, they are not taken at any place except in Barbados. Again, that, that, that identification of Barbados. The method of taking them is by sailing boats, not decked, from 14 to 18 feet long and from 7 to 9 feet broad, which go occasionally to the southeast or northwest, about three or four leagues distance from the shore. So again, he's, he's letting us into what is the practice of fishing at the time. This is in the, um, the, 19th, this is the early 19th century. At that distance, they lower down the sails and strike their masts. For if they are allowed to remain standing, not a fish will come within reach of the men. A reference, of course, to the, the, um, the sail, and the shadow it cast on the water, etc. So they, they have some difficulty if you leave it up. Um, and five or six men are to take these nets apparently and who are provided with a net attached to a hoop about the size of a sugar hog's head, oh, about 38 inches in diameter. Again, valuable information on fishing practice of the time. And with fish, the men lean over the gunwale of the, of the boats, keeping the hoop up and down the sides of the boats, which are not brought to an anchor, but drive broadside to the leeward. A man or boy then throws over bilge water mixed with horse dung and broken fish, salted cod in general, which independently of the boat's bottoms being painted with slush or tallow, entice the fish alongside. The men then let down the hook perpendicularly into the sea and suddenly turn it horizontally and by this method repeat to take so many fish so, as often as to sell them at the rate of six or eight a penny. Oh, have mercy. <laughs> six or eight a penny. You imagine that? Of course, it, is it, that is contextual because by the time you're talking about a penny is a lot of money quite a lot of money even at that time our survey there that, that has not thus explained why nowhere else in the Caribbean was a flying fish taken in large quantities as food and I've already made the point that Tobago which lies to the, uh, more to the west does not appear to have a long established tradition in this area and I made the point that this was changing because Barbados, what we call Barbados ice boats. Barbados boats have been going to, and they've established an industry of, of sorts where they're born and, and packaged in Tobago. 
But it appears that only in Barbados was the boning of flying fish we find as something of an art. And I don't know if you ever observed the uh, fishermen uh, and some fishermen as well in Oystens or Bashiba or Skeets Bay or any of the other bays of Barbados, if you ever observed them boning fish. It is a special art to it. And um, I must say that um, years ago, my preference was uh, for um, not to remove all the bone. You move the bones at the side, but leave the middle bone in. Because there was something special about taking that middle bone when the fish was steamed. And, and you know, when you steam it, of course, you had to fold it and put the head, the tail, so you, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I hope I'm not disturbing some of you um, with, that, with that description, but that's how it was. Perhaps the explanation for weight in Barbados and nowhere else may lie in the greater quantities of land fish which appeared at the latitude of Barbados than further westward. That is possible. In fact, most of the literature that has been surveyed for this presentation indicates that the first sightings began off the coast of Africa, with increased sightings as we get closer to Barbados. We may also wish to speculate as to whether the tradition of boning and eating flying fish was introduced by white fishermen, enslaved Africans, or even Amerindian Aborigines. In answer to the question, therefore, why Barbados, what are the influences, I am suggesting some tentative soundings. Some of our informants, as we've already identified, had their first taste on board of sailing ships, sailing from Europe or Africa to Barbados. Granger, Ligon, and Sir Hans Sloan, who have been cited earlier, all tasted flying fish on their journeys to Barbados. It is possible, therefore, that the introduction of the regular use of flying fish might have been influenced by the experience of European travelers on the transatlantic run. We may also bear in mind that Ligon's reference to servants in Colonel Walden's fishing crew might point to an early involvement of white settlers in the development of fishing and fish eating traditions in Barbados. That's one side of the explanation. However, we might also note that there is every possibility of an Amerindian influence. We have noted earlier Ligon's identification of Amerindian fishermen as possessing specialized skills. Indeed, as Peter Drouet um, informs us, and he's looked at the, at the whole question of the archaeology of Barbados and looked at the question of the Amerindian um, sites, as he informs us, um, the Arabs of Barbados used gill nets, hooks, line, and spear in coastal refishing. He also records that these original inhabitants Fishing in pelagic waters, perhaps as much as three miles offshore, <coughs> caught both flying fish and um, um, both flying fish and used lines. Such fishing expeditions would have required the use of a canoe. Thus, quite apart from the possibility of European introduction, we must also consider the possibility of an Amerindian influence in the development of a fishing culture in Barbados. That brings us to the third possibility, enslaved Africans, who might well have introduced certain gastronomic and food culture practices to Barbados, as well as the rest of the Caribbean. As we have already observed, travelers sailing from Africa observed large schools of flying fish off the African coast. For example, Peter de Maris, a Dutchman sailing in the region of the Gold Coast in 1602, noted that sailors used flying fish to catch tuna. It should not be surprising then to find that African fishermen operating off the same coast would have been quite familiar with the flying fish, both as bait and as food. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another European traveler in, in West Africa, Richard Jobson, also observed that on the river Gambia, there was a freshwater fish, Pantodon bulchalzi, that's the, but the actual name, the, the, um, the, the biological name. <clears throat> John Barbeau, um, a French seafarer, also chronicled his experience in West Africa. Excuse me again. <clears throat> Excuse me, yes. And he chronicles his experience between 1678 and 1712. And he noted that off the coast of Guinea and, and sorry, of Senegal and Gambia, quote, the sea teams with fish because the coasts of maritime districts are thinly inhabited. And the few people who live there go fishing only when there's nothing to hunt or land. They use little boats hollowed out of a tree trunk in which they can go three or four leagues out to, of, out to, that's really out to see to fish, either with lines 
or with fish spears and sometimes with nets. So there's a, uh, um, what we call a fishing tradition that is, uh, that is identified off the Gambia and off Senegal. Barbo also observed that among the fish that populated the area off the African coast, as we've been seeing for some time, there was the flying fish. He wrote, there are several sorts of it that is flying fish. And I refer you to the two figures of the finest which I met with in my travels. They're both excellent meat, especially broiled on a quick fire and very fine creatures to look at, the look to, being 12 to 15 inches long. These when purchased, and that should be pursued rather than purchased by the shows of bonitos or of other greater fishes which greedily devour them, take their freight above water, but generally not very high, <clears throat> which is the reason that small low vessels catch more of them than the greater and loftier vessels. That's, that's again Barbeau. And these are all sources that I've read, um, read that the, back to the 17th um, century, the 1600s, the early 1700s. Another traveler writing of his experience off the coast of Guinea in the 1780s, Paul Iser, tells us that flying fish increased enormously in numbers in the, that locality that's off the coast of Guinea. He said they could be seen, in, seen rising in schools of thousands. He also observed that Africans on this coast use both hooks and nets, the latter being fashioned from the fiber of sisal plants. Such evidence contradicts that of Richard Price, who suggested that the fishing techniques used by enslaved fishermen in the Caribbean were largely learned in the Caribbean, more so that they learned these techniques from the island Caribs. My own survey suggests that we need to consider strongly the possibility of an introduction of skills already earned or learned on the African coast. In any case, we are not discounting the possibility of multiple origins in explaining the fishing culture that developed in Barbados. Thus, while conceding that there might be Aboriginal and white settler influences in the fishing culture of Barbados, it seems useful to further investigate the possible African contribution. As you may recall, Richard Ligon's history of Barbados includes mention of African crews on Barbados fishing boats within a few years of the introduction of enslaved Africans. <clears throat> Another reference to Africans as fishermen on Barbados boats come in 1724, when the crew of a Barbados fishing sloop was accused of stealing the gear of a Martinican boat off Tobago. The Barbados boat was captained by one Benjamin Charnock, and I suspect he is, he is the one who gave his name to Charnock in Christchurch. And the governor of Barbados reported that he had cleared from Barbados to fish in the waters of Tobago. Now that's a, that's a very long distance for a sailing boat of that time. Um, given the distance from Tobago, it might be considered that any flying fish caught there would have been at least a day and a half old by the return to Barbados. However, they had also gone to Tobago to waters to fish for turtles. While the governor was investigating the Martinican claims, the eight African crewmen on the Barbadian fishing boat were detained and only released when it was shown that the Martinicans were fishing off Tobago illegally. Another reference to African fishermen on Barbadian boats comes from William Dixon, who spent some time in Barbados during the late 18th century. Dixon understood the uniques of the Barbadian fishing culture and reported the catching of flying fish is I believe peculiar to Barbados. They caught chiefly during the crop and <clears throat> added to the plenty of the season. Again, they are of equal size being as big as million herrings, like the herring too. The flying fish in some seasons affords much release to the poor. I have seen them at all prices. I have mercy again, from six to sixty for a bit, or sixpence sterling. This is state of the importance of flying fish to the Barbados culinary experience apart. His account of the activities of an enslaved African fisherman adds a significant page to our tale. This fisherman, John, that's what he's called, was in 1760 the master of one of the fishing boats owned by a correspondent who corresponded with Dixon. John had about six other enslaved Africans under his control on the boat. As Dixon relates the scene, he understood <coughs> his business thoroughly. He knew the art of catching fish and selling them to advantage. Now, this is, this is a, a case we have to look at carefully. The picture we thus have of John's status as an enslaved worker runs contrary to the generous stereotypes we have of the operation of slave society. 
Apparently, John's skill as a fisherman was so highly valued that he was given considerable autonomy, spending a great deal of time outside of the immediate superintendence of his enslaver. But you may also note something else. <clears throat> Not only were fresh fish among the fare that was offered for sale, but African fishermen and their women folk added value to the fish by frying and otherwise preparing their stock for sale. Um, when we see the, um, in the 1830s, a man called um, Frederick Bailey arriving off Barbados, he observes that there, were, there was a traffic of local fishing boats and canoes that came out to the ships offering various items for sale. And those items included fried flying fish and other fish, um, fish species. So let, let's see what, um, what another person says. This is a prisoner of war, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was captured and uh, imprisoned in Barbados in the early 19th century. And this is what he says again. I saw very few fish with the ex exception of flying fish. And one could hardly escape the sight of them everywhere. They were caught in abundance all around the island by being decoyed at night by the light of a torch in the meshes, hung up above the sides of boats. Afterwards, they were carried about, ready fried by the Negroes in trays for sale. He confesses their taste is not unpleasant, and one soon becomes fond of them. So if when we go to Oystens on a weekend, and we buy some fried flying fish, or some red fish, or some dolphin steaks, or whatever, the tradition is not new. It began a long time ago, and enslaved Africans in Barbados were frying flying fish. And in fact, one fire in, in Bridgetown, I think it was the fire of 1766, began in Bridgetown because an African was frying flying fish in his house. The house caught fire, and then the rest is history. So um, here's Hawthorne. We must bear in mind, in the face of all this evidence of local entrepreneurship, that there's a considerable trade in dried and salted cod and herring that was imported from Newfoundland and other English Atlantic fishing areas. Thus, it was almost inevitable that local whites would see some opportunity in meeting the demand for dried fish. Thus, in 1809, one John J. Godin of Spike Stung petitioned for and received a patent for the curing and salting of flying fish. The local let, uh, act that was passed um, specified that a penalty of 50 pounds was to be applied to anyone using his methods without a license. If the person was enslaved, which tells us something as well, that they, they acknowledge the possibility of enslaved people getting on the act as well. They said a flogging not exceeding 21 lashes was to be applied. There's no evidence that we have that Godin ever got his business of salting fish off the ground. But the patent was there, and the act is there. You can see the act when you go to the archives. The act is there. For our purposes, however, it would seem that the market for providing such preserved fish was a lucrative one. If Godin were successful, the prospect of reducing the cost of provisioning the enslaved and poor white laboring classes was, was clear. After emancipation, his failure meant that white provision merchants who imported the dried cod and herring from North America would have little competition for their business. They will sell to the enslaved who, after emancipation, now had the responsibility of providing for their own subsistence. In that latter period, or later period, it became clear that one of the paths of self-emancipation lay in the ex-enslaved using their knowledge of the fishing trade to escape the plantation labor market. In these closing stages then of our discussion, we turn our attention to the post-emancipation developments. We've been looking so far at the pre-emancipation developments, now we come to the post-emancipation developments. One of the first mentions of fishing immediately after emancipation refers not to African fishermen, but to poor whites, who, like their African cousins, found room to maneuver options not widely available in other areas of the economy and in the fishing trade. Stipendary magistrate Major Colehurst, who was one of the first cohort of officials sent out to superintend the process of abolition reported that the majority of the lower class or order of whites were born in the colony and are a most idle and good for nothing lot, proud, lazy, and cons consequently miserably poor. They usually live around the coast as fishermen. 
Um, cohorts also provide the statistical representation of the distribution of unemployment among the laboring population, and this is developed in a table. Um, as you can see from the table there, um, he looks at the, at the number of persons employed. Sugar employs the most, but then he has a category called agriculture. I don't know where he separated that from sugar. And he has a category called none. And my suggestion is that the category none is a category that might well hide in those statistics significant numbers of persons involved in non-sugar, non-agricultural um, persons. Another man, another person, John Belson Tyne, a white barbian who migrated to the USA in 1868, has left his memoirs of post-emancipation Barbados. And I want you to see what he writes, because and this is it. He says, a few of the poorest class of whites fish for a living, literally and get tanned to the color, it might be said, almost to the consistency of Russian leather. But the Negroes, who are the chief fishermen, and we must, we must see, the, see the, the comparison point there, don't care for exposure to the sun and sea air, as they don't tan readily. I don't know how you work that one out. And they catch nearly all of the fish, as well as the turtles, lobsters, and crustacea, with which the market is supplied. So now we move past you notice that the, there's mention of, um, of a fish, but also some of the other um, things you get from the sea. Times reference to turtles, lobsters, and other crustacea remind us that wild dolphin and tuna and flying fish were the main items of the marine diet of the masses and the upper classes. Barbados had also developed a taste for shellfish. It may be noted in this regard that while such delicacies as sea eggs are not unique to Barbados, the practice of eating sea urchins is not widespread throughout the Caribbean either. Evidence from various archaeological digs show that Amerindians ate sea urchins. And again, it's quite possible that the tradition of eating this delicacy might have a strong Amerindian influence. Sea eggs are also eaten in Japan, where they refer to as uni. However, while the black sea urchin, known locally as cobblers, I think those of us who have frequency know that that's what they're called, and incidentally, Barbados is a small place. But if you go down to St. Lucie, or to North Ham, or around Harpoon or, or, or other places, they refer to some of the black sea eggs as shooters. So even this small island, there are variations in how they're called. Also, you'll hear references to what is known as sea beef. And again, if you know anything about picking the wilks off of the rocks and the other things they have down there, you'll see that there are other things that can be eaten um, off the, um, coming out of the sea environment. Barbadians don't eat the black sea eggs, though. Not all, that is. They rarely prefer the white sea eggs, Tripnustis esculenta. And when I saw the, um, the biological name esculenta, um, I thought it, it captured well um, the, 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 um, the, what bar the, the delicacy. During the 1750s, Griffith Hughes' natural history investigations identified the sea egg as a local delicacy, and he recommended pickling it in a liqueur. Anybody try that? Early in the 20th century, in fact, in 1917, a little under 100 years ago, a team from the University of Iowa investigated the marine environment of Barbados and Antigua. We are fortunate that they published their findings, and now we, we, we can look at those findings and say something about the, the early eating sea eggs. Speaking of the sea egg, which they list as belonging to the echinoidus species, the chief of this expedition reports, the urchin is common in many places along the coast. We found it quite abundant near Pelican Island. Of course, there's no more Pelican Island. On the sandy bottom, and in 1918, I found them very numerous off the Queen Hotel. And Lawrence Castle, and by Lawrence Castle, he means Sam Lawrence Castle. And this course, yes. Right. Enormous quantities are taken for food, and so great is the demand that the colonial government has instituted a closed season for them. This has not deterred a native from taking them at all times, though they are not served at hotels during the closed season, which is in the summer months. In the interest of time, I might have cut short further discussion on this CIA. At this point, but the descriptions offered by the Iowa team are too vivid to be left out. The chief writes, the gonads or ovaries are the best at the part eaten, 
<clears throat> and my divers would come up with an armful, then sit in the boat, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you again, in the state of nature, and I assume he means, <clears throat> he means naked, <clears throat> crap open the test, that's the uh, sea egg, skillfully scoop out the other viscera, leaving the orange colored ovaries in situ, and removing all five of them with a single scoop of the hand plumps the whole mess into their capacious mouths with immense satisfaction. These ovaries really appear appetizing as they lie in the white shell and are much less repellent than live oysters which are esteemed by civilized men. And later he informs us that as served on the hotel table, the sieg is a favorite dish in Barbados. And this is the only place where I've seen it used as a regular article of diet on this side of the Atlantic. At Naples, Italy, an allied species is used as food by the common people, although I never saw it served as it tells there. So we have sea eggs. We also know that whaling at one time became um, an important industry for Barbados. And the research that I've seen shows that about some 380 whales were caught between 1868 and 1912 yielding about 202 barrels of whale oil a year and also providing food for the local market. So here in Barbados, whale eating was also considered to be a, a delicacy. We also note that, um, that Barbados supplemented, occasionally supplemented their diet by catching and eating a variety of octopus known locally as sea cat. This is a relatively infrequent item in the local dishes, but when it was served, it was served pickle and lime juice. Spiny lobsters were also sometimes an item in the local diet, although it appears that this was largely sold to the hotels. But for Barbados, who were rather doubtful of a sea, which had no back door, crayfish caught at such locations as Joe's River, um, called by Griffith Views, St. Joseph River, and crabs hunting near the coast might add a little variety to the meal. And moving rapidly, there's a, um, there's a table a, taken in 1897, we're just bringing it to boy now. Not literally speaking, yes. And the table that they have here now takes us now down to the end of the, um, the, the period. 1897, the first time we're getting a substantial look at the Barbadian fishermen, numbers and statistical representations. And as you see, they, they identify the number of fishing boats, um, which are sail, which are oar. Go to the next slide, please. Right. And by the time we add them up all, um, then 281 sail boats, and 232 um, um, which are oared, and there are some 1,205 men and 48 boys. This does not include the women, who I said, who are involved in selling fish, who are involved in, in frying the fish. Um, also, um, as a, a postscript, we also have to note that while this deals primarily with those boats that are involved in flying fish fishing. As I said earlier, you have people who are fishing near the shore. They are um, using fish pots. They are using, um, they're using um, what we call greens. And they are, they are spear fishing. They're bringing in barbers. They're bringing porgies. They're bringing all kinds of fish um, to the shore. And when you, again, when you add to that um, the, the um, use of the other non-fish, um, organisms, then we're talking about a very vibrant fishing industry in this island of Barbados, and an addition um, to our, our pots, to the kitchen. We fast forward then at the end to uh, this contemporary period, and I can say to you that very little has changed in terms of the spread, the, except that the, the sea eggs have gone on a, a hibernation, or fast, they're rarer, except that whales have largely disappeared of the coast, and that we overfish most of our reefs. But the fact is that fish, and particular flying fish, still constitutes a major part of the Barbados diet. And the fried and the, the, the dried flan, the dried herring and dried cod, which were imported, continue to be imported in Barbados, and have now um, um, been graced with other new, newer names as chefs try to disguise um, the origin of the food and fixing them up in all kinds of pickles and all kinds of things. So we refer to boys called buljol and other things uh, which reflect um, creativity. Um, the whaling has ended as well, I said, but no pilots are now being educated to another kind of fishing. 
And the fish that the parrots are not being educated to, are, these are not marine fish. So specifically, I'm referring to a new kid on the block. And the new kid on the block is tilapia. And the other fish now, which are generally freshwater species, although there's some which, are, which can live in both environments. But in Barbados, within recent times, fish farming has now emerged as, as, the, as the new item of the future. But for all of us, what we've just ex we've been exposed to is a history of how Barbados comes to be where it is. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>